Alright, this is my photo portfolio for IR 104 with Professor John Hooley. I analyzed five stories from modern day society that have struck the international world within the last six months, give or take. Some of the stories are reoccurring issues that are prominent right now in today's society. The first story I covered was the terrorist attacks in Paris that occurred on November 13th, and I compared articles from the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the BBC. This image was the cover image for the New York Times article, as well as the first image of a slideshow of 16 photos, and it's of a woman being evacuated from Bataclan Concert Hall, one of the sites that was attacked, where around 100 people died. I found this image very powerful because of how blurry it is. You can tell that the photographer caught the paramedics. They rushed the injured woman to safety. It really captures how important it was to the paramedics, to law enforcement, to everybody that was at the site to get those in need to safety. And just the fact that this photographer was standing right there and caught this and it's a blurry. Like you can see that these paramedics are rushing this woman to safety. I felt like this article was the most objective of the three because it just reported the facts. It was not a breaking news story, but rather a way to tie the strings together and inform the world of everything that had happened that night. The article compared this attack to the Charlie Hebdo attack that happened last year and explained how much more catastrophic this shooting was. And I felt like that was very important for this article just because so many people were aware of what happened during the Charlie Hebdo shooting that it was good to compare, give people um, a reference. This second image is the cover image of the story that was covered by the Washington Post. This story is much different than the first article by the New York Times because it sheds a much different light on the Paris attacks. Instead of reporting on the facts of the shooting and what happened, the article focused on why these attacks broke the internet and how they differ from other international attacks. I thought this was an excellent way to cover the shootings in Paris because the public really doesn't have any idea of why everyone suddenly cares so much. Granted, the world is going to respond to any terrorist attack, especially as large as this one, but the Washington Post does a great job of explaining this event and why it was so drastic. It may sound silly to even pose such a question, but I don't really think anyone realizes that not only did this attack come out of nowhere, but so did the endless news coverage. And I felt like this picture was very compelling because a lot of schools, institutions throughout the entire world were holding candlelight vigils. I know that San Francisco State did as well. So I just thought this was very compelling because it does show that Everybody in the world, although this is only one image of someone involved in a vigil, it just shows that everyone in the world was with Paris, standing with Paris. The third story run by the BBC is very similar to that of the New York Times article because um, it just pretty much gives facts. This story was a very large multimedia piece that not only included maps of where the shootings occurred, but also multiple videos, including one of the blasts that was heard during the Paris football match. It reported the facts much like the first story, but it broke down each shooting by time, something that the New York Times did not do. It was an extremely informative piece that thoroughly explained what happened that night, and I think these images are great because it shows, it depicts three different scenarios of what was happening that night and how it affected everybody. For my second story, I analyzed three articles that covered the migration of Syrian refugees. Um, I compared articles from the Washington Post, The Guardian, and National Geographic. So this image is one of the images that the Washington Post ran, um, and it followed the very controversial photograph of the young boy face down on the beach dead. And this is a paramilitary officer who's actually carrying the boy who was found dead on the beach. The article that this photo accompanies is a profile of not only what happened to Alan, I don't know how to pronounce his name correctly, um, the dead three-year-old, but what is happening to thousands of refugees that are trying to escape Syria. This article goes into depth of what exactly happened to the boy and his family and why he ended up dead on the beach, as well as happening 
to other Syrian refugee refugees. I think that both this image and the photograph of him lying in the sand were very important in photographs that the world needed to see because nothing is more heartbreaking than a lifeless three-year-old on a beach. And I strongly believe that this is the most powerful article that I analyzed of the three. I did not show the art of the image of him lying on the beach just because I feel like it's very hard to look at. Um, personally, I am a journalism major. And when I was in my editing class, we were talking about this and we posed the question, would you run this photo? And it's unethical to run it. Um, I think it's very hard to look at, but I think it's important that it was run. The one of him face down, even this one's very hard to look at, but I think it was important that it was run because I don't think anyone realizes what is going on or how detrimental everything is for these Syrian refugees. And so, yes, it was, it was hard to look at, and I feel like it wouldn't be the best decision to make to run it if it were me, if I were the managing editor of the newspaper or the magazine or whatever, but I think it's important to run it. So I wanted to show this picture because this one is just as compelling as the other one, but it's not as disturbing. So this second image accompanies an article run by The Guardian that covered the World Bank and the UN's decision to shift the way the world is responding to the refugee crisis. And I chose this article specifically because of the fact that our final was on UN, World Bank, um, and because we discussed that. And so it was nice to read this article and be able to reference what we learned this past semester. The article just pretty much explains that the international economy needs to be doing more to support and help the refugees. Very much like we have talked about in lectures regarding the UN, all the aid that is being given to the refugees is voluntary. They are not sustainable on their own because they rely on voluntary contribution. Therefore, when the funding declines, most of the refugees do not gather the benefits, which is problematic. I felt this article did a fantastic job of putting into perspective the struggles that these Syrian refugees continue to face and how much our world is influencing their survival because we determine whether or not they're going to get the funding. The UN determines whether or not they're going to get the funding. I thought this was a great picture because it shows how much they are lacking um, and how little they have to survive off, off of. This third article I analyzed is my favorite of the three um, because it sheds a different light on the refugee crisis. We assume, kind of, I mean, I feel like a lot of people realize they're having issues once they leave, but I think a lot of people realize, like, once they leave Syria, their life is better. Everything changes. Everything is better for them. So we assume that once they leave, all is well. And that the most difficult part of the journey is the actual journey, journey from Syria to wherever they're going. But there are even more difficulties of being in another country, especially with health care. The article follows an orthopedic surgeon who illegally works in Jordan, which entails working for more hours and less pay than a legal physician would. And so... He gives light to the health care crisis that Syrian refugees face since the Jor Jordanian government stopped providing free health care to them. Without work authorization and legal medical workers, the health care system has a large number of staff shortages, those of which are drastically affecting the medical care that refugees desperately need. I thought this article was extremely important because of the different perspective it gives readers and the revelation that just because they leave Syria doesn't mean the refugees are safe and secure. Um, I thought this art article, this image of the art for the article that accompanied it, um, it's not very compelling, but it does show a child and it does address the issue that um, the healthcare crisis in Jordan specifically drastically affects families and this for instance this kid um he had a brain tumor in his head and it was like you either have to find a donor illegally or he's gonna die like that's the bottom line and so they don't or they just don't have the health care for it and they're no longer given free health care so it's not 
so much that they leave Syria and they have a fabulous life and everything is better. The grass is not greener necessarily because of the fact that it's just as hard. It's just hard in a different way. The third story I chose to analyze covers the polluted air crisis in Beijing. I compared articles from the New York Times, BBC, and the Washington Post. All three of the stories pretty much cover the same issue, but it was the different images that had a profound effect on me. So each story pretty much just says um, Beijing called for a red alert, and this is what's happening, or this is why. But the images were definitely very compelling, and I think that's what made me want to analyze these three articles. The first article, run by the New York Times, covers the continuous issue of bad air in China, and the image that accompanies this piece is, in a way, extremely haunting. I felt like this article was the most subjective of the three because it addressed the concern that even though the Chinese government issued the red alert, more needs to be done to rectify the smog crisis. This is not the first time Beijing has had to deal with thick air pollution, and it's very obvious that the Chinese want more. And so this article is pretty much saying that, okay, well, they sent out this red alert, but it's not doing anything. Even when they stopped driving, they turned off certain factories, and they restricted when people could go out. It didn't do anything, and people are still walking around with these masks on. So, The second article I analyzed, written by the BBC, is just a story about facts. The article addresses the fact that this is the first time Beijing has issued a red alert and how to term the air pollution detrimental the air pollution crisis is. Much like the New York Times and BBC articles written about the Paris attacks, this article gives a public insight to what is happening in Beijing. I think this image is very powerful because it really portrays how unhealthy the air is in Beijing as well as how much it is affecting people and the fact that these people have to wear masks everywhere they go. There's no exceptions. They can't breathe. If they breathe in the air, they choke to death. So I thought this image was very powerful um, just because it shows them doing their everyday routine in this thick smog. It's not stopping them, but it is drastically affecting them. The third article written by the Washington Post is another piece listing the facts of the air pollution in Beijing. But I think this image is extremely captivating because it re reveals how disgusting the air is in the city. While this picture is not a before and after image, there were many photographs that accompanied this article that showed clear blue skies one day and smoggy brown air the next day. And many of them were like, yesterday this is what the sky looked like and this is what it looks like now. And it was just a thick blanket of gray, brown, disgusting smog. So I thought this was very interesting and very compelling because of the fact that it's not showing people, but rather the city and how gross this is. So for my fourth story, I cover the mass shootings in the United States. I initially wanted to focus on the San Bernardino shooting and analyze articles from four news outlets to get a better understanding of how other countries are responding to the shootings here in the United States. But... Um, I ended up finding more articles about the high number of shootings as well as only one foreign article. So I kind of struggled to look at San Bernardino, but I found more information about mass shootings as a whole because I don't necessarily think it's the San Bernardino shooting that's newsworthy anymore. I think it's the fact that it was another mass shooting, which is just making more mass shootings in the United States. So I analyzed stories from the BBC NPR and the New York Times. <clears throat> so the first article written by the BBC, um, it really didn't have that captivating of an image, but it was a very intriguing story. The piece pretty much covered the statistics behind U.S. gun violence and shed light on the fact that the United States has the most homicides from gunfire. I thought the BBC did a very good job at reporting the numbers that prove the United States has an issue with gun violence. And this article was just pretty much reviewing the statistics of gun violence and showing that the United States has a mass shooting issue and that in the UK, Australia, and 
I don't remember the other one. Let's see. We'll open this one. Something's yelling at me. Okay. So I feel like I should have included this, but I found this really interesting. The UK, Australia, Canada, and the United States. First of all, the United States has the most homicides. And then, second of all, they have the most homicides of which by guns, which I just, that right there just shows, hey, we're doing something wrong. How can we look at Canada, Australia, and the UK? We are clearly doing something wrong if 60% of our homicides are by guns. So I found this article very interesting because of the statistics that it included. All right, so the second article was powerful because it tallied up the shootings in the United States and really stressed the argument that this is an incredible issue in our country. The image that accompanied this article is haunting because of the fact that it readdresses the devastating shooting that took place in Sandy Hook in 2012. While this was not the main focus of the story, I thought it was a great way to tie the strings together and make the point that this is a recurring issue in the United States that haunts our country. And I just felt like this was a very good image to put on this article because it shows, hey, do you remember Sandy Hook? Well, this last shooting in San Bernardino is the deadliest shooting since Sandy Hook. Like, Sandy Hook was devastating. 20 children under the age of five were killed and six teachers, and now they're saying, well, San Bernardino was the, is the second deadliest that's unacceptable. So I thought this was a really good image because it takes us back to that extremely deadly, devastating, catastrophic mass shooting that happened and says, hey, there's something wrong. This has happened again. What are we doing wrong? So this story covered by the New York Times addresses the fact that these mass shootings have become a daily part of American life and that they need to be stopped. The image that accompanies the article is not very compelling, but I felt that the story itself is what intrigues readers, and that's what intrigued me. Everyone continues to ask the question, how do we stop these mass shootings, and many people answer, but it isn't often that the media takes these answers into consideration and reports on them. The article is a great way to inform readers of the haunting effects of mass shootings, as well as reassure readers that their opinions are being taken seriously and that their voices are being heard. So, of the three articles, I felt like each one addressed mass shootings differently, and I think that's very important. I really liked this one. The image was kind of like, eh, but I really liked this story because it specifically took readers' opinions and readers' voices and placed it in the story and said, this is what people are saying. The media tends to say what they think they want the public to hear. So even if they take someone's opinion and they blast it on ABC News, Fox News, whatever, it really doesn't matter. It's twisted. You know, it's not a true opinion. It's not a true voice. And I feel like the fact that the New York Times did more than that, they took those voices into consideration and reported on those. I think that's very important. So I really liked this article for that reason. So the fifth story I covered was the issue of abortion. I originally wanted to analyze articles that covered the issue of defunding Planned Parenthood. And much like the mass shootings, I wanted to find foreign articles um, or articles from other countries and see what they're writing about um, defunding Planned Parenthood, and that's where I initially started. But when I typed in abortion law, abortion laws into Google, I was like overwhelmed with articles regarding this huge controversy in Ireland, and it amazed me. So I decided to cover that issue because I found a lot of Irish text or Irish news outlets. Um, and so I analyzed three articles from the Irish Times, The Guardian, and the BBC. So, I was extremely disappointed in the image 
that the Irish Times ran with their article. I don't know how credible the Irish Times is, but it was a really, it was a pretty good story, and it had a lot of facts. It was kind of short, but it just gave me more information, and so I used that article, and it was very informative. Um, prior to the reading that story, I knew nothing about the abortion laws in Ireland. The article pretty much addresses the issue that the laws set in place to prevent abortions have been unsuccessful because a large number of girls and women who can afford to travel seek abortions in England and Wales. It was a short piece, but straight to the point. It wasn't the most exciting of the three, but it did a good job of explaining the issue of abortion laws in Ireland. And it pretty much just addressed the fact. And the main, the main issue, I guess, is that they have these laws in Ireland to prevent girls and women from getting abortions. But it's hypocritical because the whole point is to prevent these abortions when the reality is it's driving more people, more women and more young girls away from Northern Ireland to get more abortions. So it's almost like the laws are enforcing abortions and the whole point is to say you can't get an abortion and so it's their whole argument is that it's hypocritical it's not doing anything it's causing more women and more young girls to travel to go get abortions rather than limit them if that makes sense this article was definitely the best of the three I analyzed um, it shed a light on the fact that this is not a new revelation in Ireland, but rather a reoccurring issue that is repeating itself and is taking women back to the 19th century and prior. Not only were facts, the facts of the in the article incredible, but so were the numbers. And so were, I mean, this picture is great because it just shows a wide variety of women from young to old. Everyone's fighting for this. I thought it was, I thought the image was the most powerful of the three because it has such a wide variety of women and it's showing that they're fighting for their human rights um, and rights as women and rights as human beings because this law is doing nothing. It's hypocritical. It's forcing more women to get abortions and it's not fair to them to have to travel to get these abortions. So. The third article was very much like the first article in the sense that it just provided readers with facts and the image was not so compelling. But unlike the first article, this story had a lot more statistics, all of which were extremely shocking. I'm not naive to the fact that the United States is the only country struggling with abortion laws, but I was genuinely shocked to see that this is just as a big issue in Northern Ireland as it is here. Um, and that's what really shocked me was the fact that I typed this in. And maybe it's just because right now it's occurring. Right now it's a big issue in Ireland. But the fact that I type it in, I'm just like overwhelmed with all these articles. It's just amazing to me that this is such a big thing and that women are being deprived of their right to make the choice. So anyway, I really enjoyed this project because I am a journalism major and it was interesting to look at different articles, see what other people are writing, see how different news outlets are addressing it. Among the few foreign news sites that I could find. I found it very interesting how they addressed United States issues. I also found it interesting how you, the United States and our American outlets, news outlets, um, are addressing foreign issues. So that was really interesting. Um, and I just want to thank you for this semester. It was a very informative semester. It helped me climb out from underneath my rock and really educated me on what is going on in the world, something that I feel like a lot of people really need to invest in because of the fact that so many people are ignorant. And all they really need to do is 
watch the frontline documentary, The Rise of ISIS, or read an article about the Rwanda genocide. All these things are, are there for them at their hands, right there, people don't do. And so I'm very fortunate that I have the opportunity to educate myself because of this class. Um, I feel a little less ignorant now. So I just want to thank you for doing a really good job at educating me and teaching me about what's going on in the world because it does affect, it does affect us. Granted, we're not over there, but it's affecting the United States. So thank you. And that is all.